Hello, welcome. We're going to get started. Ooh. I have new glasses and I can't see without the glasses, but looking at you guys with my glasses doesn't work. Um, okay, so welcome. Um, I'm Becky O'Brien. I'm the chair of the communications, the RAC communications subcommittee that puts on this event. Um, thank you very much for coming. Uh, first, I would like to recognize the RAC uh, subcommittee. <laughs> the RAC Communications Subcommittee that helps put this on. If you all could stand. Got a few people out there. Thank you so much. Um, and I wanted to uh, recognize any newcomers. If this is your first meeting, if you'd please stand so we can welcome you. Nobody's Welcome. <laughs> Thank you for coming. And then we also have uh, remote attendees who are joining us. Hello and welcome. Um, uh, and then just a few reminders. So we've got name tags on the table. If you please you know, put a name tag on so people know who you are. Fill out the, um, the sign-in sheet so we know who's, who's come. It's very helpful for us. Um, there's also a notice for uh, a call for volunteers on the table related to online an online forum testing, so um, feel free to check that out and get in touch with us if you're interested in volunteering. Um, uh, after the after the RAN meeting, we will have the presentation and video up on the uh, the ORSP website for future viewing, and um, schedule for upcoming meetings. Um, and then after the meeting, we will also be sending out a survey. If you would please uh, fill out the survey and give us feedback, we'd really appreciate it. Um, okay, great. So we will get started. So uh, I would like to introduce our MC for, for today, uh, Craig Reynolds, the Executive Director of ORSP. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Good to see you all. So I always have difficulty with my drinks. Not, I don't have a drinking problem, but uh, that's going to be in the way, so I'll just put it on the floor. If I disappear from the camera, it's because I went to get a drink. So, um, so when Becky asked me to be the MC for today, I gladly accepted and then immediately regretted saying yes. Because I thought to myself, what can I possibly say to you all that's new and different than what I've said before? And then I got to thinking about it and um, realized it's February and it's gray and it's cold and spring seems so far away. And T.S. Eliot said that April is the cruelest month, but I truly believe it's February. And so I was thinking, what could I say? And uh, I, I think I hit upon the right thing. So last November, December, I gave a presentation Patrick was there, um, where I was doing a train the trainer uh, event where I was learning to be a trainer and getting feedback. And the objective of the presentation was to teach your audience how to do something. And I couldn't remember, I couldn't, what in the world could I teach my audience to do? So I, I, I hit upon it, and here is my presentation from last November. So let me begin by asking all of you. How many of you feel like you have buried the needle when it, on your happiness meter? How many of you feel like you are maxed out on the amount of happiness you could have in your life? I see not a single hand. Okay. That's good news. So here's what I have to tell, tell you. I have a two-step, maybe one or three or four, maybe five, step program on how to be happy. And I think this is something that you can take today with you, power through the remainder of February until the crocuses start coming up and you see the, the signs of spring and you will feel happy once again. So here is the price of admission. This is what it's worth. So today's learning objective, pretty simple. You're going to learn how to be happy. Again, that's really worth the price of admission. So how do you do that? It's pretty simple. Two easy steps. Number one, recognize happiness is a choice. We have choices every day, whether or not to get out of bed. Sometimes that's a hard choice to make. 
But when all is said and done, if you choose to be recognizing that happiness is a choice, and step number two is choosing to be happy. Could it be any more simple than that? Now, it's a bit of a truism, um, and you think, well, that's pretty worthless advice. Thanks a lot. Um, I want my money back. Um, but in reality, it's a conscious choice, and it's not something that happens automatic, automatically. And if you take time and put effort into it, I promise you, you will be happy. Now, if you're thinking that wasn't worth the price of admission, <laughs> I'll add four, I'll add two more steps. Step number three, make a list of whatever tends to increase your happiness. Take some time, be thoughtful. This, and I, I have done this, literally. Um, about a year ago, I made a list of all the things that make me happy. And I try to do the things that are on my list more often. So four easy steps. Recognize happiness as a choice. Choose to be happy. Make a list and do the things that are on your list. How simple is that? Well, maybe you're looking for even more advice. Extra secret bonus tip number five. <laughs> Ignore other people's lists. What is going to make you happy it might not be what makes other people happy and vice versa. And to that end, I would also encourage you to stop reading all of the advertisements that come in the newspaper if you still get a newspaper. Those things are, I think, they're just made to make you envious about other people's lifestyles. Make a list, keep it to yourself, and follow that list diligently and spend time making it happen. And suddenly, you'll find you're happy. So let me just add, why MMV? Your mileage may vary. What, what do I know? I'm, I'm just this armchair psychology here, but I think it's fairly good advice. So um, tip number five, what is it? So here's Craigslist. I am not saying this will work for you, but I'm just giving you an example of what works for me and the fact that I spent, a, I, I spent time paying attention to what makes me happy. That's, that's my spouse over there. So I spend time with people who make me laugh. That's number one. Uh, spend time with people that you care about and make, make you feel good about yourself. And to that point, I was, I was reflecting on a Mark Twain quote, and I, Mark Twain's one of my favorites, and I've, I've slogged through all three volumes of his autobiography, if that doesn't tell you what kind of a fan I am. And he said, to get the full value of joy, you must, divide, you must have someone to divide it with. Think about that for a bit. So spend time, for me, spending time with people who make me laugh, and that includes my wife. I like to vacation on Beaver Island. That's a picture of Donegal Bay and Beaver Island. I like to listen to music and I like to play music with my friends. I personally get a lot of joy out of doing good work in ORSP. I love my job. And then there's other things that also are key to my personal happiness, like acknowledging and be thankful for my privilege. Just because we're all in this room today means we all enjoy some privilege and so recognizing it and be thankful for it. I like to remember that life is short and absurd and keep things in perspective and be kind to other people and assume that others have the best intentions and forgive and forget easily and take some time to be grateful. Look for what's positive and what's funny in every situation and have low expectations. Don't think that you're going to be happy and that you deserve it. Whenever happiness happens to you, enjoy it but don't expect it. And that one just annoys my wife all, all the time because she wants to be happy. And I don't, I don't object and I don't argue it, but my standards are a little bit lower. The point here is not, again, what makes me happy, but only a couple of these are actually activities. The rest are all attitudes. Going back to the lesson about choosing to be happy. So the three-step program, in summary, to achieve happiness, choose to be happy, Make a list of what makes you happy and then do what makes you happy. It sounds like that life is, the t-shirt the company, life is good. Maybe I should start making shirts like this, but I'll tell you what. Bonus tip number one, ignore any self-help advice. Build as the X steps to achieve Y, like the three steps to achieve happiness. 
And bonus tip number two, ignore life advice that's painted on a sign. I'm tired of going to people's houses where the signs tell me, this is how you're going to be happy. I have enough directions at work. I don't need, uh, personally, I don't need directions at home. So you can take the same advice here with the, the, the jerk who's standing up here telling you how to be happy. But I do wish you good luck. Uh, I hope that you take some of this to heart. I hope that you are happy. And if you, I promise, if you, if you do these things, you, you will be happy. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to a very happy person, Jody Richardson, who's here to talk about technology transfer and reporting and compliance. So Jody, to the stage, thank you. Thank you guys for having me here. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk. Um, this is a subject that may not make everyone happy, and I, <laughs> I completely understand that. So, um, in keeping with Craig's theme here, I, I put together a little slide of a few things that, that help make me happy. Um, the first would be my family, which includes my husband and my dogs um, that are prominently shown here. Um, another thing, you know, music. Um, I don't play music. I have no musical talent whatsoever, but I really enjoy listening to music, going to live shows, um, that sort of thing. Um, I love going to see theater and other types of live performances, which Phantom of the Opera was the last one that we got to go to. Um, helping others. Um, another thing that's, I guess, on here a little bit is uh, visiting local breweries and the local craft beer scenes. So, um, those are just a few of the things that, that make me happy. All right, um, so I'm here from the Office of Tech Transfer, um, and just a little overview of you know who we are, why we exist. Um, our office is responsible for the commercialization of discoveries that are based on U of M research and intellectual property. Um, we are made up of licensing people, we have a venture center, um, some legal help, marketing, and then business operations professionals. Um, so we assist U of M researchers with protection of their discoveries. Um, we try to prepare those to get those to the marketplace. Um, the goal you know, is to market and license technologies to companies. Um, and we also have a, a lot of people that are dedicated to helping U of M startup companies. Um, you know, this is really why we exist. It is our job to make sure that every U of M research discovery has an opportunity to change the world. So disclosing discoveries to our office. Um, there are a lot of reasons why. Probably the most important are uh, university policy. There's university policy that governs um, that research discoveries are supposed to be disclosed promptly to our office. Um, it is also required under the terms of all federal funding agreements and most um, non-federal industry-sponsored agreements. Um, it's also important because it allows us to, you know, assess the, the research. We can do a, an assessment to determine what protection options might be available, um, what the market looks like, what the commercialization strategy might be. Um, and, you know, we want to learn about these things as early as possible in order to protect things before their publications or they are made public, um, which hinders our protection abilities. And again, we're looking for opportunities for societal impact of the work that's being done here at the university. So when to disclose to our office? We say disclose early and disclose often. Um, we need to know about things before there are any type of publications or public disclosures. Um, again, that's because those situations dramatically affect the options we have going forward to protect or to commercialize. Um, it's important, again, you know, before there are discussions with anybody outside of the university um, so that we can assist with putting NDAs in place if those are needed and things like that. Um, there are some cases where it's good to let us know before you submit a funding proposal. Um, there are some funding proposals that include, you know, some terms where whatever you're putting on your um, submission is theirs, basically. We've run into that a couple of times. 
um, and again, before you know anything is made available to others. Um, one thing too that we would like people to know is we are encouraging now the disclosure of ideas to our office. Um, you know, this is to let us know about work that has not yet been reduced to practice. Um, and this allows us to do an early assessment so that we can say, you know, there are a lot of other people already working in this space. Um, there is no IP protection available here. Or maybe guide somebody to say, you know, there's a market for this over here if you just tweak this one little area of your research. Um, and one thing we are doing actually is working with our um, online database vendor to customize our disclosure forms and to provide a simple disclosure form for ideas. And so that brings us to the how. How to disclose to our office. Um, we have an online portal on our website that allows inventors to submit our current disclosure via the online system. Um, we encourage this, um, but access to this system is granted through our integration with the HR system here, um, and only certain uh, work titles are given automatic access. Um, so that's going to be your professors, assistant professors, things like that. So you may run into um, cases where students or staff members don't get automatic access. Um, and in those situations, we do have a Word doc that can be downloaded and used. And more about how to disclose. So what should an invention disclosure include? Um, Really, if you're talking about an idea, that's going to be obviously a much more simple description. It might just be, you know, what you're hoping to achieve. Um, if it's something you have already done, then we really do need a sufficient description. What um, the government and other agencies will require is a fully enabling how-to description, um, you know, explaining what it is, how it works, um, and, and, you know, enough detail for somebody to clearly understand what the invention is. Um, generally, an abstract is not sufficient uh, for this, but a draft manuscript often is, is plenty of information. Um, all of the contributors should be included on the disclosure. Uh, this would include non-U of M people. Um, a lot of times, you know, those people weren't listed and then we'll find, about, find out about them later. Um, and the earlier we know about them, you know, the easier it is to start working with their institutions as well. Um, for contributors, you know, we need basic information, their name, their institution, um, their department affiliation is very helpful, um, particularly if they're affiliated with more than one department, which happens often. Um, we would like to know which department they are affiliated with with regards to this work. Um, funding information is obviously vitally important. Um, we need to know all of the support that was used for this work. That would include internal U of M support as well as any external funding. Um, so foundation support, industry, federal funding. Um, we need to know about all of those things so that we can complete the compliance requirements that are behind those things. Um, again, public disclosure details. If you know that you know a researcher is planning to submit a manuscript or has some sort of presentation scheduled uh, we need to know the details about what that is when it's planned for um, for federal compliance we actually need copies of all of that public disclosure material so we would need a publication if it was a poster we need a copy of that to submit to the government um, so knowing about those things early, again, helps us to track and know when our deadlines are going to be and what information we need to complete the compliance requirements. Um, and then there are a few supplemental questions on the form, um, you know, such as whether they have a VA appointment or, you know, some other questions that dictate who we have to notify. Um, and then I'm just going to talk a little bit, give a, a general overview about, um, you know, the major aspects of federal compliance. 
Um, you know, as some of you may know, that prior to the Bayh-Dole Act, which went into effect in 1980, um, all work that was done under federal funding uh, basically belonged to the government. Um, universities and researchers couldn't do anything with it. Um, we had to just give it back, and it kind of went into a black hole, and they didn't do anything with it. So with the Bayh-Dole Act, that allows us to basically retain ownership rights. Um, we can then pursue patent protection, we can commercialize, um, and we can move on you know, with further development. The Act uh, does apply to pretty much all federal funding agreements, including grants, contracts, and co-op agreements. It does not apply to um, core facilities funding or some training grants. Um, and, you know, under the rules, U of M employees that are working under federal funding awards basically agree to abide by all of the terms. So this is a list of some of the concerns um, that the major agencies are having right now, which includes NSF, NIH, DOE, uh, DOD. Um, these are kind of the concerns and some of the issues that they're facing with regards to enforcing compliance, which, you know, these terms and requirements have been around, like I said, since 1980, um, but it's only been probably within the last three years that the government has actually started trying to enforce a lot of these things. Um, but the agencies are concerned about the lack of knowledge. Um, you know, institutions, researchers, they don't know what the requirements are of the federal funding that they're accepting. Um, the agencies are finding that there's a lot of non-reporting uh, and under-reporting of inventions and discoveries that's going on, um, as well as not reporting patents that have been filed based on that research. Uh, one of the things that they are becoming more and more concerned about is the commingling of funds. So mixing federal and non-federal funding together, particularly when there's competing ownership and IP terms in those things, um, as well as you know using awarded funds for things that are outside the scope of the project for which they were awarded. So those are kind of a couple of things that they're looking at particularly. Um, another one is incorrect acknowledgement statements. Um, in publications. This one is starting to get us a lot of rejections from the NIH in particular with regard to our funding. So, you know, if a publication lists five grants, but, you know, we only show on ours two grants and we're reporting two, the agency is now coming back and they want a detailed explanation of why don't these match, you know, why were these included there but not here. So. That's one of the things that we're struggling with quite a bit right now. Um, improper assignments is not really something that's been a huge deal here, um, but at other institutions, they're failing to get the necessary assignments from uh, investigators to the university. Um, and again, the U.S. manufacturing noncompliance, there's a requirement that um, work done under federal funding uh, be substantially manufactured here in the U.S. Um, and if it's not, you have to get a waiver approval from the government. Um, and again, that hasn't been something that's been a big issue here. So what are the risks of noncompliance? Um, you know, these are, are kind of a big deal, being that we receive so much federal funding for the work that we do here. Um, you know, we could have loss of federal funding for a particular project for a PI or a group of PIs or for the entire university. Um, and we don't want any of those things to happen. Um, the university could lose rights to a specific invention or all of its IP um, for noncompliance. Um, you know, the agencies could get less money if they can't show the results of what the money is going towards. Um, it could be a reason to you know, provide additional oversight and more hoops to jump through. Um, you know, possible litigation, um, you know, and other things that none of us want to see happen. Um, Non-federal compliance is actually pretty similar. Most of your industry-sponsored um, agreements are going to include terms that are similar 
um, and in most cases more restrictive than the government. Um, they could have additional terms for reporting, for royalties, uh, for ownership interests, so a lot of those are even more difficult to administer. Um, and a lot of times the non-federal awards will include provisions that state that you're not allowed to use any additional funding from another source on that project. Um, all right, I guess that's all I have there. Um, so does anybody have any questions real quick? All right, I'll get, turn it back over to Craig. Thank you, Jody. And so why were we telling you this? Let's just say that we have an opportunity to improve our compliance with Baidol reporting. And what I'm going to ask all of you, both in the room and watching via webcast, is if I could get a commitment from you to take this back to your unit, to your department, and share what you've learned with your faculty, whom we are ultimately depending on to, to report all of these inventions. And here's the thing, it's not just when we're closing out the project and we have to submit the final invention statement, for example, to NIH. That's really not the time for us to, to be talking about inventions. It's when we get the funding right out of the gate. And so anything that you can do to help spread the word would be very appreciated. So. Jody, who's tasked with uh, enforcing our institutional compliance with Baidol reporting, um, is, has a much easier job of it. So, is there a question back there? No, uh, okay, sorry about that. Um, so, thank you, Jody, for sharing your knowledge, um, and I hope that you will go forth and, and, and share it in your units as well. I know that that's a big ask, but I, I do appreciate your, your efforts in that regard. So, um, another happiness quote, Abraham Lincoln said, folks are usually about as happy as they make their minds up to be. That sounds about right. And I'll tell you what, um, one person who I always see with a smile on his face, usually running through the hallway, walking much faster than I could, is Chris DeVries, who is the project manager for RAC. And he's going to give a, uh, an overview and an update of all the things that have been going on in the Research Administration Advisory Council. And before Chris comes up here, I just want to say, that, um, and I'm sure I'm speaking on behalf of Debbie Talley, the, my, my co-chair to RAC, is that this particular organization, which is composed, comprised of all of the research, not all, many of the research administrators across campus and in this room, is really a point of pride for this institution. I think that we are truly amongst the leaders and the best when it comes to leveraging the expertise and talents of all of you. And I just couldn't be more proud of the work that the RAC committee does and the subcommittees and the working groups and everyone else. So I want to thank you all, and I'm sure Chris will do the same when he gets up here, not to steal your thunder, but um, I'm, I'm really just so proud of the work that you all do. Um, I, I talk about it wherever I go, and uh, so I want to thank you with a smile on my face because I'm happy about it. So with that, uh, Chris DeVries, would you please come up? Thank you. Thanks, Craig. I guess Craig said it all, so I didn't need to prepare all these slides, so thanks, everybody. No, in all seriousness, um, when Craig talked to the, uh, the RAC communication subcommittee about doing a happiness theme, um, I thought, okay, I can get behind that. Um, I did have a sneak peek at Craig's slides, so I knew what he was gonna talk about, um, and I misread his step that said ignore other people's lists, and it just, I thought it said ignore other people, so I was like, okay, fine, I'm not gonna do anything with this happiness. And then I reread it and thought, oh, that, okay, I missed a few words there. So I don't have a list because I'm ignoring other people's lists and I'm not creating one myself. But what I've tried to do is kind of intersperse some uh, things that I'm happy about, things that make me happy throughout my presentation. So um, I hope those kind of come through. So first of all, does anybody, Becky's not allowed to answer, does anybody know where this is? And I'll step back so the folks on the side can see. If you don't, that's fine. This is Haleakala in Maui, Hawaii. It is a crater 
that was formed by a volcano. It's on the easternmost side of, um, of Maui. Uh, this is, it's kind of hard to see, so I, I was going to dim the lights in here, but I didn't want to create any um, workplace hazards. But for folks at home, or if you're going to view this later, you can hopefully see. My wife is a photographer and took this picture. Um, it's actually at the top of a mountain, and um, you can see the sunburst and the um, the, the uh, lens refraction there, and that's unretouched, so that kind of gives you an idea of um, the beauty that's at Haleakala. Um, it's said that, um, that the crater was where um, the god Maui, his grandmother, lived, um, and Maui asked his grandmother if she would help him capture the sun to help delay its arc across the sky so that the days could be longer. So that's something that makes me happy as we kind of get to this part of the year where um, we've had the time change and now the days are starting to get a little bit longer. Um, so again, this place is um, a place where you can see that. I highly recommend it. Um, this, if you could see the picture, looks like Mars and this is at about 10,000 feet. And you juxtapose that with um, sort of the, the beaches and the, and the seascape of Maui and it's, it's quite amazing. So that's my happy place. So in terms of what I want to cover today, um, I'd like to give you all sort of an overview of RAC, sort of how we got to where we are today. Um, I'll talk about the structure of RAC, just to give you an idea of um, what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. We'll talk about some of the accomplishments that RAC has realized over the last, well, it's been about almost seven years now since we sort of uh, instituted the RAC. Uh, we'll talk about looking forward, sort of my vision for the future with RAC. Now that I've been in this role for about two and a half years, I feel like it's probably okay for me to kind of help institute some change. Not that um, it's bad change or change that is um, shocking. It's probably most of you might not even notice it. Um, and then how you can get involved. Um, so my objective for today is really to kind of give you some information about RAC, um, kind of dispel any misconceptions that might be out there. Um, and hopefully leave you with a desire to get involved. So, I thought the best way to do that would be to have some testimonials, but I didn't have time to really talk to anybody in RAC and because I'm busy, I'm in a lot of meetings. So, I thought I'd kind of give some testimonials that I found about committee membership generally. So, a committee is a group that keeps minutes and loses hours. I'm sure we can all relate. We've all been part of a committee where you feel like, boy, that was a waste of time. And I will say that Uncle Milty also had a quote about happiness. He said, money can't buy you happiness. It does give you the ability to look in more places. So if you see, traveling is kind of one of the things that makes me happy, and so I do agree with that. But if you don't want to take advice from a comedian, um, you can always take advice from a titan of industry. So Charles Kettering said, if you want to kill any idea in the world, get a committee working on it. So that may be true from your experience. Now, I would take issue with Charles Kettering because they actually named a town in Ohio after him, and I would imagine that naming a town does not happen without a committee. So, you know, he's kind of playing both sides there. So, having said all that, I wanted to kind of give you sort of the history of the RAC, sort of, again, how we came to where we are today. Uh, so there was a memorandum from the Vice President for Research at the time, Stephen Forrest, back in March 2012, um, in which he authorized the creation of the RAC. Um, it wasn't until a couple months after that, sort of working out um, some logistical uh, details, that the first meeting of the RAC, which has now sort of morphed into the committee at large, happened in September of 2012. Uh, our RAC subcommittees, the four subcommittees that we have, and I'll kind of talk about that here in a minute, but um, those really started their work in earnest in January of 2013. So, or over six years that a lot of those committees have been doing um, what I feel is really excellent and tremendous work. Um, the first RAC project manager was hired in August of 2013, so um, I preface all of what I'm about to say by saying I, the RAC project manager position is the only position that's actually paid to work on RAC, so um, thankfully we have that. We created a set of bylaws in July 2014, which really kind of help us have some direction in terms of um, how RAC should be structured and, and sort of uh, what that process looks like uh, in terms of initiatives. And finally, and I don't want to have this be the end of our history because it's certainly not, but in terms of the structure we have today, uh, we initiated the RAC Faculty Advisory Council in uh, March of 2015. I really feel like that sort of was the missing piece. I wasn't involved with RAC um, at that time, but 
kind of looking back at the history, I think that was sort of the missing piece, but um, it fills in that gap very well. So, in terms of the purpose, so I'm kind of excerpting here from the memorandum that Steve Forrest put out in, in 2012, um, but one of the things he talks about is providing monthly meetings for senior research administrators and what he calls support professionals. So again, if you look at this, it's not referring only to senior uh, research administrators, but it's referring to support professionals. I read into that and I say that is all of you. Um, again, there's no qualifiers on that, it's all of you. Um, another goal was to integrate the then existing e-governance team and the uh, sponsored programs advisory team, if you all were around and remember the SPA team. Um, so this was trying to kind of uh, coalesce a lot of those groups around uh, one central group. And allocate at least two representatives from each academic unit to the RAC, uh, more if the work dictates. But what uh, Steve Forrest said was really the key goal for the RAC was to promote greater awareness and shared ownership of both strategic research initiatives and administrative infrastructure. What I really focus on here is that shared ownership piece. And again, this is where um, I've heard through uh, my time in RAC that um, some folks may view it as an exclusive club. Um, I'm here to tell you that that's not the case. I'm not a member of many clubs, but they let me in, so I must be doing something right. But again, it's that shared ownership, so I don't view that as um, being exclusive to one person or one group over another. Now, in terms of our goals realized, so I have to say, it might be hard to see that I love these kids. When I was looking for free images to do this presentation, I typed in victory, and this is what came up. So I love these kids, they're awesome. I love my kids, I love these kids. Although I started thinking, I wonder if what they've done is just hacked into the grading system and given themselves A's, so maybe, maybe that's why they're really happy, but that's okay. So again, to kind of recap those goals set out in the memorandum from Steve Forrest, in terms of providing monthly meetings, um, we've done that. So we have regular meetings of the RAC committees and subcommittees. Um, some of those committees may not meet, over the summer or over the holidays, um, but I can say each month of the year we do have at least a couple of RAC meetings um, going on. In terms of integrating some of the groups that were in existence at that time, um, the RAC really has done, uh, I think, excellent work in terms of collaborating with other groups on campus that you may not necessarily um, automatically think about in terms of research administration, but they do play a vital or, or key role to kind of helping you all do your job. And then in terms of allocating two representatives from each academic unit, um, we have done that. All academic units, including Flint and Dearborn campuses, have representation on the RAC. And like I say here, a multitude of central units. We continue to look at uh, if there are other central units that need to be involved with RAC, depending on sort of what our aims are. And then again, that key goal of promoting greater awareness and shared ownership. I feel that we've sort of realized that goal, but I also understand that that's a subjective goal, so it's very hard to measure greater awareness or shared ownership, um, but I can anecdotally say that in working with the committees and subcommittees, I really see that happening just in sort of the interactions with folks. Um, within RAC, we always seem to have at least some issues that are maybe sensitive to one group or another, or it's hard to kind of build that consensus. Um, but again, I think just in the way I've seen people interact with each other, um, they may not be happy all the time, and I don't know that that's what Steve Forrest wanted us to do, is to make everybody happy, but I think people get enjoyment out of being able to collaborate and work with their colleagues. However, I'm always of the mind that we shouldn't um, ever stop finding ways that we can improve, and so that's um, sort of where I see my role with RAC right now. So I just wanted to give you a quick overview of the RAC structure. Um, I'm not going to belabor any of these uh, points or committees. If you want more information, I would certainly encourage you to reach out to me or any of the chairs that are on those committees. So our RAC Executive Committee really helps set the tone um, for RAC, and our chairs are Craig Reynolds and Debbie Talley. We also, I mentioned, have a Faculty Advisory Council, and this is, again, a group that's providing faculty input on a lot of the initiatives that RAC might have going on, but we also sort of take feedback from that group to see if there are things that they would um, like the RAC to work on in terms of reducing burden. 
Our chair is Kate Eaton from the medical school. You can see that these are kind of connected. We actually have joint meetings with the, with the executive committee and the faculty advisory council. Our communication subcommittee, uh, as you all know, we uh, put on the RAN meetings, and that, that group's job is to foster communications among the research community, and Becky O'Brien is the chair. The RAC metrics subcommittee, as its name implies, um, is always looking for ways to kind of help you all um, have an idea of productivity, of um, other issues or, or um, data that might be useful for your leadership, and Chris Allen from ISR is our chair. Melissa Carby from the School of Dentistry chairs the RAC Process Committee. Um, and again, this group is really looking at ways that we can improve processes, specifically between central units and, and um, the academic units. Um, but we also kind of work on some larger, more um, university-wide initiatives as well. And then RAC Training. Um, this group's job is to assess the training gaps, um, to help design and develop uh, training programs and our chair is uh, Judy Carrillo from the med school. Um, as you probably all know, Navigate is really the key outcome of the RAC training subcommittee, um, and I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge David. He's not here, he's actually participating in a research study, so we'll have to see if he gets back for his update, but it's okay, we have a plan. So anyway, even our folks who are on the RAC and, and Navigate are um, actively involved in research as well. So these are really, the foundation of these is all the RAC committee at large, and that really, to me, kind of helps ensure that we have broad representation. Um, and as I mentioned before, I'm the only paid person on RAC, so um, the 101 volunteers, um, I can't thank you enough. In fact, if you've ever been involved in a RAC committee, work group, subcommittee, navigate course as a design team member or an instructor, could you just stand right now? And if you're watching at home, just raise your hand. It won't look weird, I promise. So can we give these folks a hand? Thank you. So some of our accomplishments. Um, I could stand here for probably another two hours and list off all the things that we've done, um, but I don't want to I don't want to waste your time. So I've picked some uh, accomplishments from each of the four subcommittees over the last six years. Um, I, puzzles make me happy. I hate when I get to the end and there's that one missing piece though. But puzzles make me happy, I think mostly because lots of people have different ways of doing puzzles. So there's a lot of different ways to get to the same result. Um, and I kind of think that's what RAC does is we really look at what are those alternate ways to get something done. Um, and maybe even question if what we're doing is the right way or if there's a better way to do it. So RAC communications, you know we hold the RAN meetings. I sort of had a renewed appreciation for how much it takes, how much effort it takes to conduct a meeting like this, um, having been on the side of a research administrator but coming in um, to the RAC. Uh, the RAC communications, you may not know this, but they, that group provided a lot of input. The uh, RAP and RAPID newsletters that you see come out, um, they provided a lot of input on the design and, and sort of giving feedback on that. That group also helped roll out a Forms E worksheet when NIH um, so wonderfully decided to revamp all of their forms. RAC metrics, so I mentioned the visualizations that we have in Tableau, those we continue to add to. This group has also developed a current and pending support tool so you can pull information from business objects related to your faculty for just-in-time information or for an RPPR, um, and it kind of helps get that in a nice form. And something else you may not know is that RAC Metrics really helped ORSP develop their customer survey. Um, ORSP is not necessarily using it as much as they were in the past, but I think just based on my own experience, that really helped to improve a lot of processes within the office. Um, so again, the RAC Metrics subcommittee was really instrumental in, in helping um, with the data aspects of that. RAC Process. So for those who remember the old form 7471, which was always fun when you have about 10 sub-project grants and you, nothing adds up. So this process was moved to an electronic process by um, the RAC process subcommittee. They've also worked on developing um, what we call our roles and responsibilities matrix. We're on about phase seven out of seven, so we're almost done but those other phases are available out on the ORSP website, and this really helps research administrators and faculty understand um, where their responsibilities lie in the entire um, life cycle of a project. Uh, 
The closeout checklist, so this came about as a result of people wanting to understand what's all involved with a closeout. If I want to close out early, what sorts of things do I need to be um, cognizant of? And then rack training, so again, I think the biggest outcome that we've seen from rack training is the Navigate, the suite of Navigate offerings. Um, I think key among those is fundamentals. Having been a raindrop myself, I have to say that fundamentals really does a great job of sort of supplementing and supplanting what, um, what we learned in, in the RAIN program. Um, the RAMP, Research Administration Mentoring Program, I have sort of a close personal connection with RAMP, so I sort of had to selfishly put it on there. It does make me happy to work with RAMP. Um, and then our Lunch and Learn series. So if, if you don't know, the group that was tasked with organizing the Lunch and Learns really did a great job of sort of planning these out. Um, so it wasn't just sort of a one and done. They really looked at um, what we can do down the road. So looking forward, um, this is again my vision. So um, a lot of this has to sort of be done in conjunction with the RAC committees and subcommittees. Um, but facilitating broad involvement from all unit levels. Um, I know that sometimes when you're maybe four or five levels deep in a school or college, information doesn't necessarily trickle down there. Um, and so, but my job is to sort of make sure that we do have representation from all of those unit levels. Um, and again, I, I want to make sure that we're not sort of, you know, just looking in one area over another. Um, we've been doing some work to analyze the, um, the Navigate participation data and really see how we can use Navigate as a pipeline for RAC and RAC in turn as a pipeline for leadership positions in your school or college. Uh, one of my goals is to sort of document the membership process, onboarding, offboarding, and review um, so that folks here, and, and again, being transparent about that, folks um, who have an interest in that can see how that works. I think it's probably about time that we took a look at the bylaws. They're almost five years old. Um, not that they're bad, I think they, they do a great job, but um, sort of looking at those to make sure that they're still relevant and, and um, really looking toward the long-term success of RAC. I mean, if you know me, I've been in a lot of customer service positions, so my goal is always to deliver a very high level of service, um, in this case to all of you and all research administrators. So finally, how can you get involved? Um, I would say one thing, if you just want to get some cursory information, please visit the RAC webpage. Um, you can see our committee rosters, review the bylaws, um, and check out the minutes from previous meetings. I do have to warn you though, our, our minutes are a little jumbled. We're working with our web vendor, so pay no attention to that. But if you have questions on those, you may certainly contact me. I would also say talk to other folks that you know who've participated in RAC in your units. Um, maybe ask them what they feel your strengths are that you could um, uh, devote to RAC. Contact me if you ever have any questions or would like to get involved. But I really think one of the best ways that you can get involved with RAC is to start with a Navigate course. Um, I don't know if everybody can see, but the Navigate courses are all up here on the screen. Um, that's a good way to really get information and knowledge that's going to help you um, be successful should you decide to join RAC. Um, but it will also kind of help you develop that network. Um, so I wanted to say thank you. I won't have time for any questions, but I'll certainly make sure to be available during the networking break and after the meeting. Um, so thank you for your time, and I look forward to talking to some of you about RAC. So thanks. And before we go to break, I just wanted to give you a few quick professional society updates. So first, from Encura, the National Council of University Research Administrators, they're the Midwest region, which I know sometimes it feels like we're in Alaska, but we are in the Midwest. Their spring meeting will be at the end of April in Columbus. And the theme, if you can see it, the theme is the sound of compliance. And I couldn't get Simon and Garfunkel out of my head yesterday. I don't know why. They are also, the Midwest region has a Mentoring Our Own program. Um, this is to help develop uh, leaders in research administration. Applications for that are due on March 19th. And the Incur National Meeting will be in Washington, D.C. in August. Um, we're announcing this now because the registration actually opens in April, which will be before our next RAND meeting. For SRAI, the Society of Research Administrators International, their annual meeting will be in San Francisco in, towards the end of October. Also, the Midwest and Northwest sections have a joint meeting in Chicago. Um, that meeting is the end of April. And the Michigan chapter of SRA has their chapter meeting coming up in June at the Grand Hotel on Mackinac Island. 
um, I think it would be useful to just go, even if the programming is kind of there, you know, you can say, well, I get some, you know, I, I can travel, I can get some more, um, expand my horizons. And if you want, and we'll, we'll have these slides available after if you need um, the contact information. These are all the folks who are involved with um, the Michigan chapter of SRAI. Um, and I, having worked with all of them at one point or another, I can say they would certainly be happy to help you out. And finally, from NORDUP, the National Organization of Research Development Professionals, their annual conference is again at the end of April, and that is in Providence, Rhode Island. Um, and the early bird registration will be ending soon. And they are also having their Great Lakes Regional Conference here at the University of Michigan in October. Um, this is sort of a save the date announcement. Um, I'm told there will be a registration fee, but it's not required that you be a member of NORDUP to attend. So, having said all of that, we will move into our networking time. I see I'm over my time a little bit. How about let's come back at 3.05. Thank you.
Okay, folks, we're going to get started again. Got quiet. Wow. Are, are we good to go on the video? Thumbs up? All right. So welcome back. I hope you enjoyed the break and had a cookie or two. So uh, before we get into our next speaker, I just, I thought I'd share something with you that I, f I found um, a couple years ago that I, I thought was joyful and amusing. Uh, how many people here have heard of the Positive Lex Lexography Project? Positive Lexography. So it's basically a dictionary of untranslatable words from other languages. So apropos of today, sprinkle this in your co daily conversation. A solar fry is Icelandic, and it means when workers are granted unexpected time off to enjoy a particularly sunny or warm day. So look, look forward to that one. Uh, Utapils is Norwegian. That's a word that means a beer that is enjoyed outside, especially in the sunshine. So have a solar fry and enjoy your utapils. Uh, giggle is Tagalog for the irresistible urge to pinch or squeeze someone because they are loved or cherished. How nice is that, huh? Uh, fiaka is Croatian for relaxation of body or mind or the sweetness of doing nothing. I like that one. And one that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to butcher, but it's, it's my all-time favorite, is Finnish. And it's Hupaturni Turditus. Bouncy cushion satisfaction. The relaxing feeling of sitting down in a comfortable chair. What a great word. I, I, and I challenge you to remember it. So um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to, to Brian Van Sickle, who is pinch hitting for Debbie Talley, who could not join us today. Brian is financial senior, senior manager in sponsored programs, and he is here to give us the update from sponsored programs. So would you please welcome Brian? Good afternoon, everybody. And yes, this is my normal voice for those of you who know me. I'm a little bit under the weather, so I will apologize and attempt to not touch anything so I won't infect anybody. I usually get sick once every winter, and since I'm sick today, that should mean spring starts next week. I was unaware of the theme, but coming to the RAN meeting always hits my happy space because those of you who know me may be aware that I have a little small addiction to sugar. And so as long as there are baked goods at any location, I'm always fine. And for those of you who are department administrators, if you're ever looking for a yes answer, small hint, this is the easiest way to get a good tee up to your question, is to deliver it in a box with something homemade. Uh, just one caveat, I do not like coconut. So just to be clear. <laughs> So I saw the slide deck and was like, oh, I didn't even know we had some of these things to share today. So I will do my best to speak to them. Uh, there have been some emails that have gone out about some new e-learning courses that the BRAC communications and uh, training groups have put together. Uh, there are three new modules, and they are modules that not only are available online, but we are also attempting to reference them in our communications to campus when we send out financial reports to help those of you who are new, who haven't had a chance to get to uh, training yet, and who maybe just need a refresher on how to prepare financial reports, how to analyze cost sharing, or how to just look at different types of expenditures and how to categorize them properly. So this is all material that's been taken out of the Navigate Fundamentals course and has been put into a medium where it can be consumed in little discrete chunks and hopefully give everyone an opportunity when they've got new folks that they're onboarding to get them some information before they can get to a class or a series of classes. Um, also in the finance umbrella, and I thought that they were gonna be on the tables, but 
I don't know that I saw them. Um, so we'll get them up on the website for the RAN materials. Um, the internal controls group within finance, along with the folks that work in property control and property disposition, have been putting together some one-page job aids uh, that they have sent out to the campus community. My understanding is that most of those documents have directed themselves to people who do inventory at the unit. So if you're not the inventory person for your department, you may not have um, seen these yet. Um, but they talk about things like how to scrap something when it's no longer having a useful life, what to do if you're transferring or moving equipment from one location to another. And they continue to kind of work their way through the catalog of equipment related issues. For those of you who've been around the last few years and who monitor our audit activities, um, four years running we had audit findings related to federal equipment and our challenge was with keeping track of it and keeping it um, costed properly and, and making sure that when we disposed of it that we gave the government their due proceeds. So a lot of this work has been in that effort to clean those audit findings up. And I, well, am unfortunately not wrapped for the 2018 audit, I can tell you that we do not have an equipment finding for this year, so that's a positive. And then the last slide that I believe I have is about staffing updates. Um, so as you all know, it's never boring in sponsored programs. Uh, people come and people go. Oftentimes they go and they're here, but they're just not working for us any longer. Uh, so in the Office of Contract Administration, we had a senior contract administration position that was open. And that position has been filled uh, with somebody who was on the customer service staff for a number of years, Dean Mahalik. So uh, if you used to have Dean for your customer service coordinator, you may now be getting communication from him if you're opening up new subawards. Um, on our reporting team, uh, we hire twice a year. So we had our new cohort of individuals that started in January, seven bright and shiny reporting accountants, um, none of whom we brought today because they haven't earned any cookies yet. But they're doing okay. Um, so please be nice to them. They're sending out their first reports to campus. Um, and we hope that they will all be successful and stick around for a while. And then uh, lastly, um, we're in the process of filling Dean's position on the customer service team. So thanks to Amanda Simon and Leslie Chavez, they have been pinch hitting and doing not only their regular jobs, but also covering for Dean's position. Uh, we hope to have a permanent replacement name for him by the end of next week. And in addition to that, we've welcomed two staff members who used to be on the reporting team, um, James Craven and Shelby Springer. Would, would you all stand up, just wave your hands? They're typically our shy accountant type of people. Um, you may not see their name on your ERPM panels or in M pathways at any time in the super near future, uh, but they are busy helping us process transactions, and so you may get questions from them. And that is it for sponsored programs. I'm going to turn it back over to Craig, and he's going to do the ORSP update. He's a real trooper, that Brian. Thank you for pinch hitting for Debbie. Um, so where will I? I'll start with another quote. How's that? I don't know who this guy is, but I like the quote. Guillaume, Guillaume I'm not. A, I don't speak French, obviously. Guillaume Apollinaire said. Now and then, it's good to pause in our pursuit of happiness and just be happy. It's pretty good advice, so I like that. So I have uh, uh, a f more than I can possibly cover in 10 minutes, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be exceedingly quick, as a, like a, I'm capable of ever doing that. But um, on the staffing front for ORSP, uh, two things worth noting. One is that we are currently in the process of, of hiring uh, a new assistant project rep to fill a vacancy that we had recently. And Beth Wenner, who is a project representative on the private sponsors team, is going to be transitioning over into clinical trial activities. Still on the private sponsors team, but new responsibilities for her, which uh, we hope will begin April 1st. Um, our, our dearly departed uh, Daryl Weinert, uh, 
still alive and kicking in, in Pittsburgh, but uh, dead to us. No. <laughs> Daryl, uh, his position is not being eliminated, is being eliminated, so that's not, not, we're not going to be seeing the likes of him again or an associate VP for business operations. And so UMOR has, the U, U of M Office of Research has reorganized a bit, and if you're curious, uh, to see the org chart changes, there is uh, the January 25th edition of the UMOR News where you can see that, for example, I now report to Jack Hu. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy about that. Uh, just reflecting on January and February and s the challenges that we've had as an institution and the fact that uh, we did have an unprecedented two d uh, days of emergency reduction in operations d uh, declared for the campus, meaning we were closed. I just want to reinforce the message uh, that ORSP, um, perhaps to your surprise, is not considered an essential or critical service, and so we too are closed. Um, and that means we do not conduct business like anyone else who is not expected to come to work. Um, and that, what, so what I'm suggesting here is that um, it's not a bad idea to plan ahead. We can't predict the future by an eight ball maybe or, or check the weather station or the weather channel. Um, if you see an impending uh, snowmageddon like we had a few years ago, that if you can get work to us sooner rather than later, that in increases your odds of getting a proposal submitted uh, prior to a, a campus closure. Um, if you're lucky enough to be working with a sponsor that has a late submission policy, you might want to reach out to that sponsor and see if they will give special dispensation to weather-related events uh, being a reasonable reason for not submitting on time. So um, not all sponsors have that, and we recognize that, but uh, we are uh, not a critical service. Quickly moving on to some of the agency updates. Uh, you may have already seen this particular uh, announcement come out in a wrap or a rapid, I can't remember which, the Research Administration post. Uh, but I want to encourage you all when you're having that conversation about the Bayh-Dole Act, uh, you can also talk about some of the requirements that NIH is recently enforcing with greater scrutiny. One is to make sure that your faculty are disclosing on their other support forms all of their support, regardless of whether or not the support comes to the University of Michigan. So if they are a PI, for example, on a grant from the European Commission, and that grant goes to another university in the EU, that's still other support that needs to be disclosed, even if the University of Michigan is not the grantee or awardee of record. And finally, there's this, this new, it's not a new uh, idea, but this notion of a foreign component. And NIH is, is uh, giving greater scrutiny to whether or not we have, as an institution, and in, in our proposals and our PPRs, disclosed foreign components. A foreign component is whenever a significant part of the work that's funded by NIH is conducted outside of the U.S. And here's the, cab here's the sticker kicker here. It doesn't matter who is paying for the work. So it doesn't matter if it's NIH money that's supporting that work outside of the U.S. or another funder. As long as we have someone who's working on that particular scope of work and those specific aims, then it's a requirement that we disclose it on, on the... The, either the proposal or the RPPR. So spread the word, if you would, please. Uh, there are some new program parent announcements, sorry, some parent program announcements, that's a big difference, uh, for basic experimental studies involving humans. This is having to do with the definition of clinical trials and basic sciences. Uh, so there's, there's an opportunity now to use a different type of uh, program announcement for this kind of work. There's a new requirement on training applications to provide a letter verifying that U of M has all of the policies and procedures and oversight necessary to prevent harassment and other discriminatory practices. And if you go to the ORSP website, you'll see a link, which links to another website, which links to another website, which gets you to that letter. So follow the bunny trail. Uh, and there's also uh, just a reminder that the inclusion across the lifespan policy is now in effect. Um, also, on the foreign collaborations front, we received a, a second hand from DOE, a notice that they're about to, if they haven't already issued a policy statement that prohibits 
uh, our employees who are funded by DOE to partici from participating in foreign government supported talent recruitment programs. What is that? Um, so that is when a foreign government sets up a program to give money to recruit faculty to come to their country to set up a lab or get a research program uh, going. So, and DOE is particularly concerned about certain countries more so than others. They're probably not gonna uh, uh, say anything about Canada, but um, some of our more adversarial relationships in uh, like Russia or, or, or China are going to get scrutiny from DOE. So uh, those, any affiliations that our, our faculty might have with a foreign government supported talent recruitment program need to be terminated if, they, in, if that individual is supported on DOE money. Um, the National Science Foundation, uh, it would be a good idea for you to check their post shutdown webpage. Uh, they did delay the implementation of the new uh, PAP guide and the, the general terms and conditions until yesterday. So now in effect. And they did extend certain deadlines as a result of the shutdown. So if you go to that web, web page, you'll see a listing of all of the program descriptions, announcements and solicitations and dear colleague letters that had a, uh, an extended deadline because of the shutdown. How am I doing on time? That's yeah, so, all right, I'm doing okay. So moving on to some of the changes and you'll hear more uh, in the I ITS update, but uh, a few of the changes in the e-research proposal management system that I wanted you alert, I wanted to alert you to um, is that uh, effective yesterday with the release uh, that went in, went in the system over the weekend, um, you now have uh, new options when you have the, when you have to disclose animal research on the path. So n now you can either choose that only work is being, animal research is only being done at U of M, or you can choose that only, that work is only, animal research work is only being done at an external entity, or both at U of M and an external entity. It used to be that you, it was a, you couldn't choose the both option. Now, maybe that's not a big deal to you, but to the people that, that work in the animal research space, this is a, this is a, 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 a huge accomplishment. So look for, look for that um, change in, in the path. Uh, there's some new functionality in the system about linking awards. And I don't wanna go too far into this, but um, you may be seeing some of this in the near future where uh, ORSP, a project representative, will be establishing relationships between two separate awards. And there are only certain circumstances in, during, where we will establish that relationship. It's when two awards share the same fame, that's the federal award ID number for the new folks, or an award shares one path and the awards are either non-federal or they're fed, it's a federal contract with no federal award ID number and the Boolean logic just keeps going, or, or the awards share a single project is recognized by the sponsor, and each award is clearly identified as a component of that project. Don't, don't quiz me on this. What this means is that in certain circumstances, like when award, we have multiple, we have one fane for two awards, we submitted one proposal and we got two awards, and they, have the, they share the same fane, we're gonna link them in the system so, they, so that there's a, non-reporting relationship between those two award records. And then we have something called the restricted award relationship, which is even more rare. And I don't think, I mean, you can read these slides later. We're not gonna go through this one in, in, in any great depth, but just so you know, any um, projects where like we have a holding account or a master account that has some money, um, like the, 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 Brian, help me out, Sigler, is that, would, would that be? an example, or Toyota Research Institute. There, there are certain uh, projects where we have, uh, are, we're creating relationships between multiple awards so that we can get out of the business of having one massive award record with multiple projects under it that impede our ability to transact on, on each award's sub-award record. So um, more information coming on, and, and if you have one of these, you will be hearing from us directly, I'm sure. Um, we in RSP are in the process of, of preparing a deliverables pilot 
So just as a reminder, in the award management uh, functionality on the award record, there is already an ability for you to enter deliverables, final reports and annual reports and the like. ORSP is gonna start using this to complete the, uh, the uh, entering the final closeout documents that are necessary for property control and tech transfer and procurement. The only takeaway message here for you all is that don't assign a deliverable to one of those, op one of those offices that are going to appear as, a, as a, a choice, okay? So you can still enter your own deliverables, that's fine. Just don't assign a deliverable to one of these other offices. Um, when it comes to uh, the award record and, and people, PIs in particular, just know that uh, ORSP is going to manage on the award record who truly is, is a senior or a key person which is different than who is a senior or key person on a proposal. Sometimes we'll have many key people on a proposal, but only one person is a key on the award based on the notice of award record. So ORSP is going to manage just the senior or key people on the award record, and it's a project teams will have the ability to manage, change, remove all of the non-key pe personnel on the award record. So we're, we're making that distinction and giving you all the, the ability to, to manage non-key people. And because this is a new process, there are going to be some award records where a key person, a non-key person has been identified as key on the award record incorrectly. If that's the case, you can sub submit a request action or modification, but you don't need to submit a PACAR. So let me say that again. If, if you have someone who should be a non-senior person and that person is on the award record as a key person, just submit a request for us to change it and you'll be good we'll, and we'll make the change. I think this, yeah, so before I get to the good stuff, um, the one last e-research proposal management tip is, um, you may already know this, but when we have a path and that path in the proposal results in award, in an award, we create an award record. And while we transfer some of the individuals who are administrators and 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 PIs on the path over to the award, that changes over time. The path gets locked down. And so as, as the award develops and over its life cycle, people change on the award, it's gonna be different than what's on the, on the path. And so the message here is if you want to talk to, if you wanna find the right person to talk to about your, your award, don't look at the path because you may be identifying someone who handled the proposal rather than the award. So always go to the award record because that's where it's gonna have the most current and up-to-date information, whether that's a unit administrator or a project representative in RSP or a customer service rep in sponsored programs. Okay, so I can't see that far, Chris, uh, but I'll, I'll keep pl plugging along here now with the internal deadline policy update um, and I can, I, I, I lose track of how much I've told you already, so bear with me. This is either repeating something you already know or, or at least level setting. So here's what the policy says. There are two service standards that uh, will be delivered depending on when the finalized path and proposal arrive in ORSP. If the proposal gets to us four or more business days in advance of the sponsor's deadline, we're gonna check that proposal against the sponsor's guidelines and the university's requirements. Uh, and we're going to essentially guarantee that the proposal will be submitted by the deadline, successfully received by the sponsor, and that we're going to look at the terms and conditions to make sure that we can accept that any binding terms and conditions that would be resulting in, in, a, in if an award were to be let. If we receive the proposal two or more business days in advance of the sponsor's deadline, we're going to check the proposal against university requirements and we're essentially guaranteeing submission by the deadline. Everything else is not gonna happen and, if, and we can't make any guarantees that it'll, the proposal will, will be successfully received or it won't be uh, returned administratively triaged for non-compliance, but we guarantee that we're gonna get it submitted. And then anything that comes into our office less than two business days is at risk. Um, we'll try. 
but we can make no guarantees that anything will get submitted. Um, so that's the, po that's the policy writ large. Uh, I've been working with a, a cross-campus working group uh, to, to discuss changes related to workflow and policy and the proposal approval form. We meet every two weeks or so and have been for um, at least a year. Um, and we're making good progress and we're getting close. But we're, what we've decided is that the, this is a lot of change to consume all at once. And so we're, we're going to release the policy in basically two, two phases or, or more, depending on how you want to count. Um, phase one, not like my happiness slide. Uh, uh, phase one is we're going to introduce changes to the path. So there will be new changes to the path um, and there will be reordering of, of, of of questions that already exist. Uh, we're going to begin raising awareness about the policy, although we won't be enforcing it. Um, we will be working with the schools and colleges to help roll out and build awareness about the changes to school and unit uh, policy requirements. We'll, we'll uh, introduce the PATH redesign. And there's a couple of changes that I, I want to, to point out in, that, will, that we hope will occur in phase one. One is that how ORSP interacts with project teams uh, is, gonna, is no longer going to be through the posted comment. We're going to be using the ORSP request changes as, an, as the way that we send uh, information back to project teams for, for making corrections. And we're gonna have two different kinds of feedback that we give you that align with the different levels of service. So there are going to be required changes, which are those changes that align with the limited institutional review and then there are recommended changes, which are more like grantsmanship issues, which align with the, with the fuller review where we're looking at these, uh, the uh, sponsor guidelines. Uh, so that's, that's the short version of it. And as, as uh, we, we expect at the earliest, this will be June of 2018, perhaps later, depending on how things, things go. So um, phase two of the deadline policy is going to be when we actually implement workflow and enforce the deadline policy. So I, the, the, the date for phase two is TBD. And the reason it's TBD is because I don't wanna make a commitment on when is the right time for that to happen. I want to be assured that everyone understands the policy, is familiar with the path changes, and that we are well positioned to do this successfully and seamlessly. So um, we'll know, we'll have a better sense of that as phase one uh, evolves, but I don't want to make a commitment now that would put us in a position um, where we, we, we're not doing a, a good job in change management with respect to the actual policy. So as phase one goes, uh, we, will, we will communicate and train on phase two. Uh, there will be additional functionality, which I'll, I'll share in a moment. Um, and we have programmed the system to send out email notices at various points in the workflow so that no one is surprised about the service levels that they can expect. So this is a highly, highly idealized version of the PATH workflow, but it's very, um, some of it should be, should be familiar. Um, in, this, in the perfect world, a path starts out and a proposal starts out in unit review and it goes through, it's waiting, it gets approved along the way, it's eventually finalized. There's going to be a service level calculation, that's the magic diamond in yellow where we determine what level of service a proposal gets based on the sponsored deadline, comes to RSP and then we submit. That's, that's the, the perfect world and seamless one fl flow. Um, what's gonna be a little bit different is that uh, proposals will be sitting in the awaiting final proposal once all of the unit approvers have given their, their okay. And ORSP will not be seeing those proposals until we actually get a final proposal. And then it will come into ORSP's inbox in queue for, for review. And as I said, there will be the service level calculation where we give it the two or four day or at risk uh, category. And there's gonna be a new state called deadline missed so that if um, the, after that calculation is done and the deadline is passed, there will be a new state for the path where it will go into the state of deadline missed and it will stay in that state for 30 days. And the reason we're doing that is because um, sometimes, well, if it, after that 30 days, if nothing changes, it will, the path will go into the state of canceled. 
but there will be a new activity called update deadline. And that will be the project team's opportunity to p enter a new deadline date in the case we get uh, approval from the sponsor to submit late or whatever the case may be. So if, if we update the deadline, then it goes back into finalize and the service calculation is done once again. And as I mentioned, we're going to have a new functionality or we're going to use consistently the re ORSP request changes. But when all is said and done, what we really hope is that there's this, for you guys over here, there's, there's a fireworks going off around the submission uh, proposal submit date. So that's the, essentially the new workflow. Uh, phase three is post-implementation where we're going to be collecting data about the policy and the impacts uh, uh, on, on the campus community and PIs, and we'll be analyzing that data and refining the policy as needed, uh, working with the research associate deans and, and Jack Hu on those folks who are what I'm, I'm calling chronic, chronic at-risk submitters, the folks who are always submitting less than two business days to see if we can work with them on, on uh, improving the, the lead time that we're afforded. And finally, still on the table is a notion of uh, a waiver requirement for any proposals that are less than two business days. And we're, we're not doing it for, for the, the initial rollout, um, but we're leaving that as a possibility based on whether or not we see the appropriate amount of, of change in the number of pro percentage of proposals that, that arrive with less than two business days. And so Jack Hu will be making a call about whether or not we will require a waiver for anything under two business days, but that's not a, that is not written in stone that it's going to be required. So, um, I th I think I did pretty good on time. Um, were there, I'm going to pause for quick questions about anything that I, I mentioned in the last 25 minutes or so. Okay, so um, this is my last quote, and I will be done, and you you will be done with me. Uh, but I, I love this one, and, and I, I, thought of, I thought of our next speaker when I read it. It was only a sunny smile, and it cost little in the giving, but like morning light, it scattered the day, night and made the day worth living. Someone who makes the, 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 the night, the morning light. Uh, I am referring to, I, I know, yes, she, uh, Carolyn Pappas is here. The, the person who I was referring to, I, although she's pinch hitting for, for Kathy Handyside, and I, th I think the same of both of them. So I knew it was Carolyn that was coming up. And come, come shed your, sh your, your sunny disposition on, on the crowd here. It's down a little bit. Good afternoon. I am here to tell you about a few other updates we made yesterday, and also to tell you that we are going to have an SF4 update um, at the end of March, after all the March deadlines, hopefully, um, and we will release more details um, prior to that date. So we are still in award enhancements mode, and we have a couple of what I hope are quick wins that will make you happy. I have slides for the first four of them, and so the last one I'm going to tell you about here just uh, in words. Um, we had a couple cases where not everyone on the PI and the award editors or the project teams were receiving emails when an award uh, agreement acceptance request, an AAR, was created. And so for those of you, uh, no one noticed it, but you're going to get more emails now, and hopefully that will help um, on the creation of the AARs. So we, underneath, uh, in ERPM, underneath all awards, you currently have a listing of all awards. We also added two new listers, uh, one for the award change requests in progress. So if you know the number, you can go there to find it. And then similar for the mods in progress. So you can see them independently of the award. We also added a few more um, data points to the award information, to the modification workspace, so it looks a little bit more like the award, um, and it definitely has uh, more information on it, which I think will be helpful. Uh, the request was, um, it's hard to tell when you look at an award workspace if there's anything happening on it, and one way we're starting to do that is to put 
more um, announcements in the announcements box. So as of yesterday, if there is an award change request that is pending, um, meaning that it's in a draft state or something other than a terminal or canceled state, you'll see a message that displays and you can always go find it on the mod slash ACR tab if you want more details on it. Uh, this was a request from the Office of Contract Administration on the post a comment activity on the award. Uh, they were being selected quite frequently. And, and in most cases, that had nothing, the question had nothing to do with them. So um, in order to help out their email volume, we put some text um, next to their Office of Contract Administration label that says only select them for outgoing subcontracts. So hopefully that will help them with the email. Um, and then lastly, this isn't, this isn't a change that we made, um, but it's a question that we get from a lot of people, central offices and schools and colleges. And that's it. If you're working on a computer and you can't see all the tabs, so on the award workspace, we have a, a lot of tabs. Um, and instead of seeing all the tabs, you see something called more. And it's, it's really annoying that you can't right click on it. And there, there isn't anything we can do about that. That's how it's delivered from the vendor. But uh, we do have um, a little help. So instead of, um, instead of clicking more and then opening up that other tab and losing the tab you're on, you can instead um, click on more, select the tab you want to go to, and then depending on what operating system you're on, if you're in a Windows system, you press control and then you click on the tab and that will open it in a new, um, a new window. And then same thing, uh, similar on a Mac, you just press command instead. So hopefully that will be a, a helpful tip. And we, these slides are posted and this information is also on the eResearch uh, help pages. We made a couple of text changes to the PI sign activity or the COI update activity that the, that the PI uh, runs. Um, You'll see a wall of text at the top. This is really to help PIs when they're trying to decide um, if they need to answer yes or no to the question. The conflict of interest um, folks in their office gave additional bullet points to kind of help people. Um, the other thing that is on the bottom is to remind people that if you say yes to this question, you have to disclose an M in form. Um, and this yes supersedes whatever your school and college policy is for when you need to disclose an M inform. And that's all I have for updates. Any questions? Otherwise, I will pass the podium to David. Hi, everyone. Just some quick navigate updates on upcoming events. Um, so, just a heads up, uh, the Spring Fundamentals cohort has been filled and that starts on March 5th. Um, we do have a lunch and learn session that's happening at the end of this week on an introduction to business objects for research administrators. Um, because that session filled up extremely quickly, we are planning on having a repeat session on April 19th. Um, the time, I know it's sort of counterintuitive, it may not actually be over the lunch hour. Um, so just kind of, if you, if you are interested in attending that session, um, do kind of block your calendar. Um, we're, we're planning on making it over the lunch hour, um, but it really depends on uh, classroom availability. Um, but also keep your eyes peeled for a rapid announcement about the um, registration opening up for that, that repeat session for the Lunch and Learn on Business Objects. Um, some additional courses coming up, Advanced Budgeting, Task-Based task -based Budgets will happen April 5th and 12th. Advanced Budgeting Internal Proposals with Cost Share will be April 16th and 30th. Uh, budgeting Basics will be May 2nd and 20th. And we had a Uniform Guidance Cost Principles date scheduled until yesterday, and then it disappeared again. But um, sometime in the spring, probably at this point, um, we're looking at the first week of June. Uh, as always, for additional information, you can go to our Navigate webpage or email us at navigate-research at umich.edu. Um, a little bit further out, we are planning on a Lunch and Learn event around mid-June that will be either on unfunded agreements or UFAs. Um, 
and or data use agreements, DUAs, so it will either be the sort of broader category of UFAs in general or it may focus um, more specifically on the specific type of UFA of DUAs. So watch out for that. And then finally, hopefully you all got um, a rapid announcement recently about the uh, release of our latest two uh, essentials e-learning modules. Those were proposal prep and submission and understanding effort. Um, and stay posted for some additional ones coming out soon. Those are financial monitoring, personnel appointments, and effort certification. That's it for me. And I will turn things back over to someone who does brighten my day with her smile, Becky O'Brien. All right, thank you all. Um, we're just gonna wrap up here. Um, thank you all for coming, uh, the new people, the people remote. Um, if you have questions or suggestions for future RAN meetings, um, uh, contact us here. Uh, at the, the email here. Our next meeting will be Thursday, May 23rd, and that'll be the shortened meeting with the uh, UMOR uh, Staff Recognition Awards afterwards. Um, and then we'll be sending out a, a survey, so please look out for that and respond, give us your feedback, we really appreciate it. Um, and in the theme of what makes me happy, um, I was, there were many things. I also uh, went to Maui a different time, but got lots of tips from uh, Chris about going and Haleakala is beautiful. But um, what I'm most excited about right now is uh, Captain Marvel will be coming out next week. <laughs> and I'm a huge uh, Marvel fan, so uh, that makes me very happy. I hope it's good. Um, thank you very much. Uh, go forth and be happy. Thanks. Thanks.